Kubernetes, Envoy, and Prometheus. You've heard the project names, but are you curious to learn more about adoption or current cloud native trends? Join the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, CNCF, for KubeCon plus Cloud Native Con Europe 2023 on April 18th through 21st in Amsterdam. Whether you're new to the world of cloud native and open source or want to refine your knowledge, the event offers something for everyone. The event also offers virtual and in-person ticketing options. As a special offer for listeners, we're offering complimentary virtual registration. Please use the code KCEUVCCP while supplies last. That's KCEUVCCP while supplies last. And don't worry, we'll put the digits in the show notes. Cloudcast Media presents from the massive studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. This is the Cloudcast with Aaron Delb and Brian Gracely, bringing you the best of cloud computing from around the world. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome back to the Cloudcast. We are coming to you live from the massive Cloudcast studios here in Raleigh, North Carolina. Hope everybody is doing well. Another Sunday perspectives. We are closing out uh, almost the last sort of last Sunday here in March 2023. Spring is upon us and uh, weather's starting to get a little bit better. Still a lot of pollen in the air, unfortunately. So apologize for that up front. But, uh, you know, we're starting to get into longer days. We're starting to get into a little more sunshine, uh, a lot, lots blooming. Um, but the other thing I want to get into today, uh, I know last week we did a sunny perspective and just kind of threw out three things and they weren't necessarily all correlated or, or related as they typically are. This week, I want to kind of talk about a couple of interesting articles I saw and, you know, what, I don't know if this is going to be a trend or not, but kind of um, an interesting contrast between a couple of articles from a couple of sources that, you know, normally you would go, okay, yeah, uh, good, reliable sources, uh, good sources of information, you know, valid, you know, data sources and so forth. But what I want to kind of do is dig into both a new uh, research article from a group within Gartner uh, called Maverick Research. So it's a new group within Gartner that is tasked with looking at disruptive possibilities that are ahead of us or, or could be ahead of us. And then also take a look at uh, a new survey around merging technologies from Stack Overflow uh, and, you know, from, uh, you know, their big sort of user base, if you will. And what I really want to kind of dig into is what looks to be sort of an interesting sort of emerging trend. Uh, and, and we've seen this for the last four or five, six months, if you've been paying attention. Um, you know, obviously we had <clears throat> some slowdown in the economy. Uh, we've had uh, some 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 groups, uh, you know, various technology groups, various technology companies, you know, have some layoffs, in some cases, larger layoffs. But, you know, uh, we've seen, you know, quite a few people, unfortunately, who've been affected by this. And, you know, what happens in these scenarios is, you know, for a long time now, if if you were sort of looking at uh, a spectrum of, you know, who had more leverage, who had more power in the classic sort of uh, workers versus managers or workers versus management, uh, you know, kind of dynamic, you know, for the last seven, eight, nine years, and especially during the pandemic, uh, you know, workers had a lot of leverage, a lot of power. Uh, we were seeing, uh, you know, salaries go up. We were seeing them have the flexibility to work where they wanted to. Uh, you know, a lot of people moved out of places like Silicon Valley and other high cost areas uh, into other places. Um, you know, so we saw and, you know, and we saw people who were, you know, talking about having five, six different job offers or working at two or three different jobs without telling anybody what they were doing to try and make extra money. And, uh, you know, so a lot of that was going on. And, uh, you know, those are the kind of things that happen when you have booming economies and you have high demand workers and and those types of things. Now, obviously, the economy has, has slowed down somewhat. We've seen some layoffs. And what I kind of want to dive into is this through line that you'll see between these two articles, um, really kind of a shifting back in terms of the leverage to uh, more towards management, but not just sort of, you know, kind of a balancing or rebalancing, if you will, sort of shift. Um, but what could become a really interesting, uh, you know, big shift in terms of management trying to look at this as an opportunity to really uh, re rethink uh, the entire paradigm of what uh, essentially IT workers look like. Um, so really sort of an interesting article from Gartner, kind of a surprising article. Um, I don't, I know that some of you won't necessarily all have access to it. I'll try and summarize it as best I can, but I want to dive into that after the break. Is your cloud bill out of control? Cloud Zero is building a platform that will let you analyze your cloud investment faster than ever before. You'll get accurate, granular visibility into your total cloud spend without the typical pitfalls of legacy cloud cost management tools like endless tagging or clunky Kubernetes support. Cloud Zero is how cloud-driven companies gain more financial control and predictability by driving immediate and ongoing savings. You can answer questions like, how can I save 20% of my cloud bill right now? 
Who are my most expensive customers? How much does this specific feature cost our business? Join companies like Rapid7, Drift, and SeatGeek by visiting cloudzero.com slash cloudcast to get started today. Again, please visit cloudzero.com slash cloudcast to get started today. Today's sponsor is Datadog, a real-time monitoring platform that unifies metrics, logs, and distributed traces from your cloud containers and orchestration software. Datadog's container-centric monitoring features allow you to track the health and performance of your dynamic container environment. The container map provides a bird's-eye view of your container fleet, and the live container view searches, groups, and filters your containers with any criteria, like tags, pods, or workspaces. To start monitoring your container clusters, sign up for a free trial today, and Datadog will send you a free t-shirt. Visit datadog.com slash container dash cloudcast to get started. That's datadog.com slash container dash cloudcast. And we're back. And as mentioned at the top of the show, uh, we're going to dive into what, um, you know, what may become sort of an interesting reshifting, rebalancing, or kind of re-leveraging of the sort of classic managers versus workers uh, trade-off that we always have in, in every industry, not just in, in the IT industry. Um, you know, it's probably been more prevalent in the IT industry just over the last few years in particular with COVID, uh, but really over the last five, six, seven, eight years, um, you know, with uh, so much growth going on in the industry, so much, um, you know, venture capital flowing in, opportunities to work at, at various companies, um, the ability to, to bounce around to different jobs, not necessarily stay very long. Um, and we're really seeing, you know, what, what feels like a little bit of rebalancing. Now, the reason I want to bring this up is a couple of things, and I've mentioned this on a few of the shows, right? So, you know, whenever we have these sort of economic shifts, a couple of things are going to happen, right? Number one, um, you get a natural kind of reprioritization that happens at every company, right? We, we, we have people and budget and focus on a lot of things when the economy is good, when the economy is booming, when things start to slow down, there's a refocus or a re prioritization of the focus back to things that are, you know, going to be the most important to the business, oftentimes the most profitable for the business, oftentimes uh, taking a, a shorter term view of things versus a longer term view of things. And so there, there's a natural kind of re rethinking, reordering, reprioritizing, re um, assessing, you know, are we still doing all the right things? Are we holding the right people accountable? Um, do we have the right resources aligned to the projects that can make the biggest difference as opposed to spreading them out into a lot of different places. So that, that goes on naturally. The second thing that goes on is, you know, we have uh, budget activities in which, you know, we go back and we look at budgets and we look at, okay, we're spending money on a lot of different things. Are we aware of everything? You know, do we kind of do a reaccounting of everything? You know, where's the money actually going? Um, do we have duplication that we can reduce? Do we have areas that are underperforming that we could cut back on? Do we have areas that we need to double down on? All those sort of things. And and budgets budgets are really interesting because what tends to happen is whenever there's an opportunity to cut back budgets, um, the first thing that finance organizations tend to do is they they tend to set a very, very low budget because what that what that does is, is number one, budgets are a weird thing and there's there's a long process that goes on and you can have sort of a top-down approach to it and a bottom-up approach and you eventually get to sort of the numbers that you can live with. But one of the things that finance tends to do is they tend to use this trick where whereby they start with a very, very low number. And and it sort of freaks people out to a certain extent because like let, let's just use some rough numbers. Like let's say like you're last year budget was $10 million for some activity. And, you know, they look at, you know, they look at the year and they look at, you know, where the economy is and maybe what they think the forecast might be for the year and maybe some sentiment from customers. Well, maybe it's not going to be as strong as it was, or there's uncertainty about when people might buy or how much they might buy. And it wouldn't be unusual for them to cut back, uh, come back and say, well, we're cutting the budget back to $5 million, right? Like cutting it in half or, or some cases even more than that. And, while the business may not be projected to be cut in half, um, they oftentimes do that because what that does is it if you cut something by like 10% or 5% or 15% or some small number, um, while that might hurt, um, it often forces people to continue to hold on to sort of pet projects because they're like, well, it's not that far outside of wh what, what should be accountable or what's priority. But when you cut it back way, way back, um, the thing that happens is you get people that, that there's a really different mindset that happens, which is, 
all of a sudden you go, okay, there's not wiggle room here. So, you know, things that we used to consider sort of borderline or, you know, hey, it hasn't necessarily panned out, but we think, you know, we give it a little more time, it'll pan out or whatever. Um, you know, you, you tend to hold on to some of these things. You know, this is the equivalent of I lived in a, you know, 2,000 square foot house. And for whatever reason, I was forced to move to a 1,000 square foot house. And your stuff's just not going to fit. Like, it's just not going to fit. And you've got to figure out a way to go, okay, what can I absolutely get rid of? Because once the moving truck comes, like, we only got a 1,000 square foot of space and stuff's just not going to fit. Stuff that was in closet, stuff that might have been in your attic or that you kept in a garage or was piling up around your room. Like, you just don't have the space. And so the reason I mention that is, you know, when you have these sort of extreme scenarios, um, and again, you know, 50% cut might sound extreme. It probably may not necessarily be extreme. Um, the other thing is it forces people to sort of not just go like, oh, we can cut back on a few vendors or, you know, maybe we don't need as many people, but sometimes it really gets people going. Maybe we need to really look at things differently than what we do. Like the path going forward just isn't sustainable. And the reason I, I use this long sort of winded preamble to, to the second half of this, this side perspective is there was a really interesting article, uh, came out from Gartner this week. Um, and I say interesting in the, in the sense of when I, uh, you know, it popped up in my, um, it's called Maverick Research, Stop Investing in IT Skills. And Maverick Research, as I mentioned at the top of the show, is this new group within Gartner um, that is tasked with, uh, you know, looking at, at disruptive, contradictory ideas, breakthrough ideas, those types of things, things that you might not expect from Gartner, which is considered more of a conservative type of consultancy or analyst firm and so forth. But, you know, when, it, when that title popped up, Stop Investing in IT Skills, it kind of caught my eye because one of the things they say, and I won't quote it all quote for quote for quote, because I don't know how much I'm technically allowed to share and so forth. Um, but in essence, it says, look, for the last number of years, um, and they, you know, they have some pretty good research to back this up. Uh, IT, you know, when they, when Gartner talks to IT practitioners about what the biggest challenges they have, um, insufficient skills has been at the top of the list for a long time, maybe one or two, but for a long time, it's been at the very top of the list. And in essence, what this new group is saying is, look, um, you know, this is a little bit like the definition of insanity. You, you know, you keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting to get different results. And in essence, what they're saying is this thing of, hey, we're short on skills, we're short on skills, we're short on skills, we keep trying to hire skills, um, and it's just not working out. They essentially say, well, stop doing that, right? Stop investing in IT skills. Uh, their, their justification is right now, about 25% of jobs that are out there posted go un, uh, unfulfilled in here in 2023. They expect that number to jump up to like 75% by 2030, which is pretty significant, right? Like right now, one in four jobs doesn't get filled. The, their projection is three in four jobs won't get filled. Okay. So what's my point in bringing all this sort of stuff up? Um, and and, the, and let me, before I get to that, you know, their, their kind of way of framing of what you should be doing is, Moving away from thinking about IT skills to IT outcomes, okay, fine. Um, I think you could argue maybe people have been trying to do that for a long time as well. Um, but in essence, they're sort of saying like, you should, you know, you you are never going to catch up to being able to hire the skills that you need. There are other people that that do this that specialize in this. Whether you're outsourcing it to a vendor, you are avoiding building things custom when you can get things from a vendor or a cloud provider or a, or you know sort of systems integrator. You should be spending all of your time, majority of your time, doing that, and stop trying to chase the fact that you tell us every year that your number one priority is is IT skills. And I thought it was a really interesting kind of bold, maybe crazy, I don't know, statement, um, you know, to, to say to practitioners, um, you know, it, it sounded very much like something you might've seen as, as a white paper from a vendor. Uh, but Gartner, you know, to a certain extent tries to say fairly neutral between practitioners and, and vendors. Um, and it was interesting because the, the other thing that I always try and do with the show is, is contrast it against something else that we saw. And, the thing that that kind of caught my eye was uh, was a, an article, uh, some research that that uh, 
uh, Stack Overflow recently came out with um, that was, you know, what what does data tell us about uh, emerging technology sentiment? So the impact and sentiment towards emerging technology, some recent data uh, and survey work that, that Stack Overflow had done. And what was interesting in there is you very much have, you know, lots of hands-on practitioners, obviously using Stack Overflow probably skews a little more towards developers, but it's going to skew towards platform engineering and DevOps and all the stuff that, that sort of fits in our domain. And they are still very much in the mindset of, you know, we are we are trying to augment the skills we have. We feel like, um, you know, the skills we have are fairly good, um, but we are trying to augment those with better skills. So it was interesting is when they, um, you know, when they talked about, hey, what are the things that, that you feel confident in that, that uh, you know, you, you think are going to emerge, that you feel confident in? Things like low code, no code type of development models were the lowest uh, in, in the list. And that, you know, at about 8% felt like they were proven. Um, and, you know, they had promise, but they only th- thought about 23% thought they were going to emerge as, as something that was going to come along. You contrast that with something like uh, AI assisted technologies, right? They only had about 15% confidence in them right now, um, but they expected it to become a much, much bigger piece of, of what was going to help them. And so there's a mindset that, uh, you know, was kind of prevalent within this study, which is, you know, today's practitioners aren't looking for things that necessarily simplify their world. Uh, they're looking for things that augment their world, right? To to take the skills they have, the creativity they have, and augment them. And I think the reason for that is, you know, over the last two decades, decade and a half, two decades, even with, uh, you know, the rise of things like a cloud guru and, and other stuff, um, you know, we've very much seen uh, companies no longer feel the burden to train people. They no longer feel the burden to invest in the people that they hire. I think this is part of the problem, maybe maybe at the core of the problem of, you know, why companies are constantly saying like, look, we don't have, you know, we can't we can't get the skills we want. It's because a decade ago, two decades ago, they essentially said, we're no longer going to take on that burden of hiring of 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 hiring more junior people, we're going to hire more senior people. We're going to expect them to have skills on day one. Um, you know, we're no longer going to take on that burden because, you know, people aren't staying nearly as long. And it kind of brings up the classic sort of, and there's a, uh, there's a cartoon about this, you know, in essence, you know, the CFO says, hey, if we invest in our talent, they might take that knowledge with them, you know, when they leave, you know, we, we might be investing in something that we don't get a return on. And the CEO basically comes back and he says, well, if we don't, then we're definitely going, you know, they're definitely not going to stay. And so, you know, I think that is a very realistic scenario that most companies no longer think that they own the burden of, of training their people. Um, people, you know, can go off and train themselves because uh, there's lots of ways to do it, whether it's open source or free tiers of cloud or whatever it is. We've talked about it a million times on the show. Um, but, you know, I think the fact that uh, IT practitioners still feel like it's their responsibility to be looking for things that augment their current skill level and and improve their current skill level as opposed to looking for ways to sort of dumb down what they do uh you know and and sort of offload it into other things and so i think when you put those two things together and again i didn't i'm not really trying to cherry pick them so that i can create this argument but it's an interesting dichotomy in that you have a workforce who is still used to the last, like I said, five to 10 years of, we have the leverage, we're smart. You should be trying to help us augment what we do, get, make us, give us situations to be more productive. Don't put us into as many meetings. Um, give us the skills and the tools to go build interesting, creative stuff, the stuff that you essentially have, have paid us for. And management is sitting there going, uh, even with all those things, I can't keep up with this gap that I have. And the reason I kind of framed at the beginning of the conversation was, you know, if we have a scenario in which, you know, the shift in leverage is moving um, and, and there's evidence that that seems to be the case, right? We saw situations where we're seeing companies, you know, requiring uh, employees to come back to the office. Maybe it's three days a week. Um, you know, there's a big fight going on over at Amazon and, um, you know, there's a fight going on at Apple. We'll see this at all the big companies. So we'll, this will trickle down into other companies, whether they're on the tech vendor side of things, or they're just, you know, kind of like banks and, and other types of things like that. 
But if we're seeing this, um, you know, leverage move back to management, management has seen their budgets cut somewhat, or in some cases, maybe dramatically. Um, and then you're seeing middle managers in particular, or maybe even senior managers who, you know, have relied on Gartner in the past, uh, because, you know, middle and senior managers aren't always looking to be held accountable. Sometimes they're looking for someone else to sort of CYA, if you will, or, or, you know, kind of, um, defer accountability. You know, when you get sort of these radical research coming from people like Gartner, um, and again, this isn't a radical idea in terms of historic context. And let me just put this in historic context. 20 or so years ago, so late 1990s, early 2000s into the, you know, early part, you know, the, the aughts of the 2000s, there was a huge movement to essentially outsource IT. There was a very famous article that I forget what I'll have to find the article um, written by, uh, I forget who it was. Anyways, essentially it said like, you know, there's no value in IT. IT provides no value because, you know, all the systems that are out there, whether it's an ERP system or a CRM system or an email system or whatever system have all become commodities and all IT is doing is just running these commodity systems. And so, you know, there's no more value in IT. So this was a this was an idea that was floated 20 plus years ago, 15 plus years ago. Um, I'll find an article. I'll, I'll find a link to it. I'll put it in the show notes. You guys can go read it just for some historical context. And we saw a lot of companies who, you know, went from having, uh, you know, bigger IT organizations, internal, everything was sourced internally to outsourcing. You know, at first it was outsourcing to systems integrators. Um, a lot of the stuff was considered like back office business process optimization types of stuff. Um, this is where companies like Tata and Atos and Infosys and, and lots of others, um, you know, rose to, to prominence and became very, very big. Um, and the, the downside of that was, you know, we ended up having sort of a, what's called um, hollowing out of organizations, right? So, you know, top level management was kept, some low level, um, you know, kind of cross-functional generalists were kept. But a lot of the people in the middle ended up getting outsourced. Now, outsourced and then a lot of times kind of insourced back into their company, but no longer worked for the company. The company no longer wanted to own that. And then we went through, you know, it went that happened for a while. Uh, they achieved some of what they wanted. Um, you know, the cost savings were never necessarily there. The agility was never there because everything was contract based and <clears throat> every change required, you know, a, a change order and a cost and all these sort of things. And um, contracts were extended out for seven years. So nobody was really motivated to, to move the, the big ball forward in year one. It was like, let's drag this thing out for six, seven years. And the reason I kind of put all this stuff together is, you know, we see history repeat itself. And so it's going to be very interesting to watch, um, you know, when management comes back and has greater leverage, like which they do right now, um, and they might for a period of time, um, and you start to see these types of of statements by very respected organizations like Gartner. Um, this is, seems like a kind of out of character for Gartner, and in fact, they actually call that out in their in their research and says, "Look, this seems out of character with what we typically tell our clients, but we're trying this new approach." Um, it will be inter very interesting to see how much of this sticks, how much of this, you know, starts to, to, you know, take, take root, begin to snowball a little bit. Um, because, you know, while it might very well be a good idea to, to shift your focus and thinking from, you know, IT skills as what you have in house to IT outcomes, that, that's probably what you should be thinking anyways. Um, you know, doing it through sort of hollowing things out, um, has consequences and they might be the right ones for the business. They might be the wrong ones for the business. Um, but you know, again, go back and, and do some homework, do some research. If you start to see these things start to pop up or if you're asked to do these types of things, um, because hollowing out of industries, um, tends to have longer term, it can have some short term, interesting ramifications, some good ramifications, but it tends to have long term, very bad ramifications. It's, you know, it's in essence, you know, what's happened here, like in the United States with, uh, with manufacturing, manufacturing has been entirely hollowed out. Um, you know, it's it's been moved overseas and, and into other parts of the world, which has been great for other parts of the world. But as far as, you know, like, say, U.S. manufacturing, um, it will take decades and decades to, to rebuild that uh, that knowledge base and those skill sets and, and just kind of the economics of what happens in there. So um, I think it's very interesting that we have a couple of pieces of research at the end of the day in which workers are looking to augment themselves. They know the burden of skills has been put on them. 
and they're looking for higher level tools to help them augment their skills, to stay ahead of it, to stay productive. And you're starting to now get some some kind of drum beating on the management side of things or some guidance to management saying, hey, don't even don't even keep investing in that thing. You will never win that thing. You will never keep up with that battle. Give up on that battle and just start, you know, looking to outsource the thing. And I think between those two things, it's going to be a very interesting potential, um, you know, just interaction for the next five or six years is, you know, basically is laid out over the next five or six years of, you know, what the future of, of IT could look like in terms of, you know, staffing, who reports to who, whether it's outsourced, whether we're seeing more and more kind of commodity systems try to be put in place or vendor driven systems as opposed to, you know, things like open source and the creativity with it. So, um, you know, take a look if you have access to the articles, especially the Gartner article, maybe you can get it through somebody. I can't give it away. I just, I'm not allowed to because of the way that I'm able to get access to it. Um, but take a look, you know, take a look at the stuff, take a look at the Stack Overflow article, but, but give us some thought. Um, and then also take a look at some of the other articles that I put in there as far as, uh, links in the show notes. It'll give you some historical context of, you know, what some of the things are and, and, and how they, they've happened because uh, history in IT tends to repeat itself. It's not always called the exact same thing, but it does tend to repeat itself and it does begin to feel like, and maybe these are completely outlier articles, but sometimes it does begin to feel like the environment is in place for what we saw, uh, about 20 years ago or so when, um, it was IT is valuable. It may not be core to the business. Um, and you know, some of the problems of it, you know, don't seem to be fixable with the old way of thinking. And so maybe a, a completely new way of thinking needs to happen. So just something to keep an eye on. i um, not trying to be a downer on stuff. Just, uh, again, you know, when you, when you see it come from prominent names, um, it, it should, you know, at least raise some sort of awareness flags, get, get on your radar as far as like, okay, I, I should pay attention to that a little bit. So anyways, with that I'm going to wrap it up. Um, another Sunday perspective. Thank you all for the time. Thank you all for the feedback we've been getting. Um, you know, we are, uh, Aaron and I have been very, very busy the last couple of weeks trying to book out shows. I think we're already booked out through May. So lots of really good stuff coming your way. Um, uh, we will continue to be doing shows, um, every Wednesday and Sunday, nothing's changing. Uh, but yeah, a lot of good shows coming up, a lot of good guests coming up, a lot of great feedback from all of you as far as uh, what you want to see and, and some great ideas as far as, uh, you know, new topics to, to start uh, digging into. So thank you all for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Thanks for helping us grow the show. Uh, excited about May coming up, uh, or um, May, April, <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself, but, uh, excited about what's coming up. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to The Cloudcast. Please visit thecloudcast.net to find more shows, show notes, videos, and everything social media.